Hi, I'm Michael Sansolo, and welcome to another episode of Shopping with Michael. You know, all of us are trying to eat healthier these days. There's different diets, different things we're trying. Well, 80% of us want our pets to eat the same way we're eating, to show some of those same trends. And we're going to look into some of these issues that are changing the pet food industry. In addition, we know that the food we buy in our supermarkets comes to us from a lot of places. And we're going to take a look into that journey that the food makes to understand how the retailer can trace the entire path of the food to ensure food safety and food security. We'll be back with all of that right after this. Billy works in a supermarket. He helps stock the shelves. One day, Billy figures out that there are 120,000 different items in a big modern supermarket. When he divided the number of items he usually stocks in a day into the total number of items in the store, he realized that it would take him nearly four years to get the job done. Of course, Billy is only responsible for the store brands, so his job is easier. There are thousands of store brand foods, beverages, snacks, health and beauty, kitchen and household products. Each store brand with quality comparable to the national brands, but less expensive. Billy smiled. Restocking store brands is a lot easier. Let's be honest, we love our dogs and cats. In fact, there are 300 million pets in the United States. And the statistics are that two thirds of households actually have a dog or a cat. And through the years, those animals have changed. There are now nearly 400 breeds of dogs out there as we create new breeds to deal with allergies or different kinds of needs. Well, we love those animals, so we treat them great when it comes to mealtime. In fact, there are services in places like New York and Los Angeles when you can order in fresh made food for your dog or cat every day of the week. In New York alone, just two of these services combined have accounted for nearly $30 million of sales in just the last year. We like to feed our animals really well, and we like to feed them the way we feed ourselves. So what we're seeing are some of those same trends in how we eat we're now expressing on our animals. Let me give you an example. Here's a can of dog food, for instance, and you know, it's the basic old dog food can. We've seen this for years. But if you look at this one, it's grain free. Now again, people clearly think this is important to their pet. This one is also free of any unnatural colors or flavorings. Here is another one, similar kind of story, the word nature put right up there. Because as we want to eat more naturally or more organically or all these other eating habits that we have, we're expressing them on our animals. And we see this in all kinds of products that we give to our animals. These have become really popular. I happen to have an, a little beagle wonderful dog, wish he was here with me today. And we feed him stuff like this. It helps clean his teeth so he doesn't get plaque and doesn't get gum disease. This is how we take care of our animals. In fact, animal experts tell us that for a lot of young millennials, they're delaying having kids. They're having animals to act as surrogate children. And in fact, a lot of us baby boomer parents, we now adopt the animals as our grandkids. We like to treat our animals really, really well. Well, to look at all these trends and how we're projecting our tastes on our pets, we've got an expert from the pet industry who's going to join us in a minute to help us understand what's been changing, what we might see in the near future, and how these products that we're buying for our animals are getting more and more specific to their needs. Bill McKee. Bill, why don't you tell us a little bit about your company? What is it that you guys make? So Simmons Foods is a third generation family owned business and we make quality cat and dog foods at our facilities in the US. We have been talking about how there's almost been this humanization of pet food that a lot of the trends that we have for ourselves we're beginning to project on our pets. Is this changing how dog and cat food is made and some of the ingredients? It certainly is and what humanization really means is we treat uh, our pets as members of the family so we want to feed them just as we want to feed our own family. It is incredible. I, I mean, there are things now, there's gluten-free dog food, there's organic, there's natural, grain-free. Is this really important to our pets or is this just stuff that we want, so we want our pets to have it? I think they are important, although I'll tell you, my doctor tells me uh, that I should have healthy grains every day. Uh, I think uh, uh, parents associate grains with being fillers and not high quality ingredients. So that's why you see a little bit more energy behind grain free and pet food. 
What are the trends do we see in pet foods these days? How have they been changing from the past? Yeah, we see a couple big ones that are continuing on. Uh, one is foods that focus on solutions. So things that address age, breed, size of dog, skin and coat, uh, weight is certainly a big one, mm -hmm. uh, and then healthy digestion. Uh, and we're also seeing a lot of energy in more ancestral diets where protein or meat, real meat is the number one ingredient, but also some unique proteins, things like buffalo, boar, and duck. Wow, one of the trends that I hear about is a lot of people are now cooking from scratch for their pets. Is this going on, and, and again, why? Yeah, uh, all in that healthy eating kind of regimen we want for our pets, although I think the home cooking is more as kind of a supplement. You know, people will grill chicken, uh, maybe buy an extra rotisserie chicken at the store, and even adding things like pumpkin on, on top of the, the pet food. And, and you know, I, I could giggle about this, but I have a grand dog, and I know we do the exact same for him. We treat him like a member of the family. Is this whole trend of, I mean, the millennials are having their children later. Are we seeing an impact on what the family looks like and how the pet fits into the family? Yeah, so for people of a certain age like us, uh, our pets are our replacement children, uh, but for your daughter, pets are the practice children. Oh, that's good, I'm, I'm good with having him. All right, we care about them like they're our children. So how do we know, in a company like yours, how do you ensure the quality of the food? Because I want that dog to eat really good, really pure food. How do you guys take care of that? Yeah, it's a very uh, holistic uh, approach. Uh, we certainly deal with uh, high quality suppliers. Uh, our facilities are tested on an ongoing basis. Ingredients are, are tested both with third party uh, um, tests as well as in-house. And you can actually do a lot of testing in-house that you couldn't do even a decade ago. That's fabulous. Now you mentioned that you are a third generation family company. I gotta believe the food is very different today than it was when this company began. Look into the near future. What are we likely to see coming from dog and cat food over the next coming years? Yeah, I think people will continue to buy more and more high quality foods. Uh, the thinking being that uh, that will be more supportive of the overall health of the animal, maybe a more preventative uh, approach. That's fabulous. Bill, thanks for joining us here today and sharing some insights about what's going on with pet food. Because as we see, it has become a much more interesting and probably a much more complex product to buy. There are more choices and more benefits that we can get for our pets. And let's be honest, we love our pets like we love our kids. We want them to be happy and healthy, have nice long lives. So thanks for joining us. We'll be right back. Rich people know all about quality. They spend lots of money to get it. But you don't have to be rich to get the quality you want in your everyday shopping. That's because store brands from your favorite supermarket, drug chain, or mass merchandiser give you comparable ingredients, taste, and performance at prices that beat the national brands all the time. Of course, you have to be a smart shopper. Try the store brands. Use them at home, compare products and results. And of course, enjoy the savings. Maybe that's why so many rich people buy store brands too. Store brands, the smart way to get quality. Whenever we go to the supermarket, there's something that is obvious to each and every one of us. There are an awful lot of products inside that store. In fact, believe it or not, there are 40,000 distinct different products inside the store, all those different sizes and different varieties. And I'm sure at some point you, like me, have wondered, how did all those products get on those shelves? Well, the entire supermarket industry is supported by this massive supply chain, and it's nothing we want to talk about today, but a lot of us shoppers are beginning to notice some elements of this supply chain that we have questions about. The first is, a lot of shoppers these days are concerned with local products and food miles. Now this may surprise you to learn, but the average American meal travels around 1,500 miles to get to our table. There's a simple reason for this. Very few of us live on farms that would provide all the food that we want to have on the table that night. The beef or the chicken may have to come from one place, Produce may be coming from someplace else. And of course, depending on the season of the year, there could be products that are grown where I live, or at other times they have to be grown in California or Florida, or maybe even in Latin America because of the difference in seasons. So when we think about local products, we have to keep in mind that there are some limitations. Depending on where we live, we can't always have local all the time. And when we look at products, and the stores have gotten a lot better with this, 
they will have signs that may tell us where the product is from. If it's a local farm, you might get to read about the local farmer and learn something about them. And even if it comes from another country, a lot of products are now labeled to tell us where they come. But that is how our food makes it to our table. So the other question that we all have is, who keeps track of this? Well, the food retailers themselves recognize that with all of these products coming from so many directions, they need to have systems so that, heaven forbid, there is a problem, whether it's food safety or something else that goes on, they can determine where the problem happened, stop that point of the supply, and fix what went wrong. And so a lot of retailers these days have something they call traceability systems. So the product on the shelf, they are able to know if it came from a manufacturing plant, where is that plant? And if that plant is fed by farms in certain region, where are those farms? So even if we are eating shrimp that might have come to us from Southeast Asia, or we're eating tomatoes that might have come from one state away from us, there are ways of backtracking so any kind of problem can be attacked and resolved very quickly. It's an incredible system. And the best part about it is, for the most part, when we go to the store, all of the items we're looking for are on those shelves where they're supposed to be. And so we can get our shopping trip done as easily as possible. That's what the supply chain enables us. And with traceability, it gives us an additional sense of comfort in the safety and security of everything we're eating. Well, that's another episode of Shopping with Michael. I hope you enjoyed learning about what pets eat and the amazing journey of the products that come to the stores that we buy for ourselves to eat. We'll see you next time for another episode of Shopping with Michael.